Hello everybody and welcome to the Scottsdale Big Book Study where we will study the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Today's date is Saturday the 24th of February 2024. My name is Maria F and I'm a recovered compulsive overeater. I'm from County Dublin in Ireland and I'm going to be your host for today's study. Our co-host is Veronica C and Q&A will be hosted by Sue L. If you've got any questions or any concerns during this meeting, please contact either myself or any of the co-hosts. And you can do this by private message. Just send us a private message if you have anything that you're concerned about. Please note that the speaker today, Harlan G, will be recorded for the duration of this study. However, the question and answer session which follows, we don't record that. So please do feel free. If you've got a question for Harlan, um, there's your opportunity to, to talk with him. We'll post a link to the previous week's recordings in the chat function um, and also a link to the second edition payment. We kindly ask that if you can just please keep your microphones on mute during today's study. And also, if you need to step away from your screen or you're exercising or eating or driving, please do disconnect your camera because it can be distracting for other people. So we are now going to go over to Harlan G in Scottsdale, Arizona to do our big book study with us. Good morning, Harlan. Good morning, Maria. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here and not to have anybody eat their hearts out. It's going to be about 80 degrees today in Scottsdale, not a cloud in the sky and about 15, 20% humidity, but I don't want you to eat your hearts out, but I just thought I would let you know just for your FYI kind of thing. And spring training for baseball is in full swing here and the place is just hopping. Anyway, I'm so glad to be here, and I just want to announce to all of you who are here, I hope I remember to do this also at the end of our meeting, July the 12th, 13th, and 14th in Phoenix, Arizona, at the Crown Plaza Hotel in Phoenix, the Scottsdale meetings <clears throat> are going to have a summer retreat, and it will be three days Friday night, all day Saturday, just about, and then Sunday morning of exactly what we do here, only it will be live, it will be in person, and it will be three days, Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. We're going to cover all the steps. We're going to cover uh, a lot of ground. We're going to get to um, have fellowship with one another. You're going to be able to expand your God squad. You're going to have a great time. If you would like to attend, go to oaphoenix.org. That's oaphoenix.org. And we would certainly love to see you. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful uh, opportunity for you to uh, just have a wonderful weekend, just a great weekend of fun and fellowship, and we're hoping that you will come to it. We're going to start today on page six, the mind and body are marvelous mechanisms, but before, oh, there's one other thing I better announce. Wait just a second here. Okay, March the 10th is a Sunday. It is the beginning once again of daylight savings time in the States. It is the beginning of daylight savings time. I will adjust so you don't have to. So unless you are in the state of Arizona, there is no difference in the time. I will adjust and I will do it at 10 in the morning rather than 11 in the morning so that you guys don't have to make any changes whatsoever. However, Here's the asterisk. If you are in the state of Arizona on Saturday morning, that means our Saturday morning sessions are going to begin one hour earlier and our evening sessions outside the state of Arizona are going to be one hour later. So in the evening, one hour later, unless you're in Arizona, in the mornings on Saturday, no difference unless you're in the state of Arizona, and then it will be one hour earlier. I know it's confusing to some. Uh, to mm -hmm. me, uh, area codes and 
uh, time zones are second nature because I've been selling on the phone for 40 years. So, I mean, I know the time zones, like I know my own name and I know, I know area codes very well too. But the bottom line is uh, that is the information. And on March the 10th is when that will take effect as daylight savings time goes back into effect here in the States. I don't know if they have that in Israel or Europe. I have no idea. I don't know. But that's when it will take effect here in the United States. Okay. Again, we're going to start on page six, the mind and body. When I was a little boy, when I was very, very young, two, three, four years old, five years old, people, meaning my parents' friends, uh, anybody that we came in contact with would scream and yell at my parents about how fat I was getting and how much I was eating. When I got to be about five, six, seven, eight, they started screaming directly at me. And what they would say was 100% true. Girls don't like fat boys. I found that to be absolutely, absolutely true. Uh, fat boys don't get good jobs. I found that to be true. Fat boys don't get opportunity in life. I found that to be true. Fat boys don't get to do this. They don't get to be on the baseball team. They don't get to be on the football team. They don't get to do this. They don't get to do that. I found everything that they said to be 100% true. There was no arguing with the truth that they were saying. What I found was that there was a profound sadness in me because I knew inherently as a five-year-old or a six-year-old that I was going to be fat for the rest of my life. There were times when I would try to control my intake of chocolate. I believed as a five-year-old, six-year-old, that if I could stop eating chocolate, everything else was okay. It never occurred to me to stop eating chicken or salami or corned beef or French fries. That never occurred to me. I believed as a five-year-old, a six-year-old, that chocolate, <clears throat> cookies, potato chips, ice cream was what they were talking about. And I did everything my little brain and body could do to stop eating these things. And I was a failure. I couldn't do it. And so I knew inherently I couldn't live with the food and I couldn't live without the food. And as I grew older and older, I entered puberty and I started watching as every day, every month passed, the world was flying by me at a rate that I could not calculate. My friends, when from the time we were 13, 14, 15, they started getting attention and cultivating attention from girls. I obviously could not do that. Uh, I wondered why the girls were so hysterically laughing at the jokes my friends told when I knew inherently they were no funnier than me. None of them laughed at my jokes, but they sure laughed at my friends' jokes. And how come none of them would flip their hair when they were around me or they would, the, how come none of them would, would ever want to talk to me. The only thing girls wanted to know from me was, does your friend like me? Does your friend think about me? And it became maddening because I wanted attention from them just like they wanted attention from them, but obviously I couldn't get it. I was 335 pounds as a senior Ooh. in high school. Uh, somebody's unmuted. I was 335 pounds as a senior in high school. I was 500 pounds by the time I was a sophomore in college. 
And girls don't normally pay very much attention to guys that are in that stratosphere of weight. It just doesn't happen. Funny how that does not happen that way. And it wasn't just the girls, but that was a big part of it. I wanted to be just like everyone else or better. I wanted to be the object of someone's affection. I wanted to hold a girl's hand. I wanted to kiss a girl. I didn't go on my first date until I was 35 years old. And throughout most of my life, I have led a platonic life. I, as I say, I went on my first date with a girl. I was 35. And in my marriage, I married the first girl. I married the second girl I ever went out with. And the first girl that ever wanted to get married, I married her. I I knew inherently that if she wants to get married, don't let her go because this may never come again. This, this opportunity will probably never present itself again. And that was a huge mistake. And it's a mistake I pay for every day of my life. I made a huge mistake because I married out of desperation. We were married for 18 and a half years. I have nothing but good things to say about this person. I wish her well, but most of our marriage was roommates. Most of our marriage was two people that shared a house and it was platonic throughout most of the marriage. There was nothing going on. We slept in the same bed and that's about as far as we got. And I missed out on a lot of life. I missed out on passion and youth and unbridled passion. And I will never be someone's first love. I will never be uh, probably, you know, the one that they remember when they think back on their life. I will not be that person. Um, I missed out on all that stuff. I missed out on, on that part of youth or that part of life that is so precious to so many. I pay for this disease every day because I could have done so much better career-wise. I could have done so much better in business, in, in something than I did. I make a living. My bills are paid but I'm going to be 70 years old here and I'm still working. I wish I didn't have to do that. I, I could have done so much better financially. I could have done, I could have done something that was so much more worthwhile to the world than what I ended up doing, save for my work in a way, which is very valuable. Uh, I have a sponsor who's a lovely, lovely man and he said to me not long ago, it's just the other day, he says, you know, you will live forever. And I said, what do you mean? He says, your podcasts and the cat, the shadow that you've cast over OA, he says, you'll live forever. And I said, well, th that's very nice of you to say. And that means a lot to me. But I wish that if I could do anything, it would be to go back and change so many of the decisions I made and change so many of the things in my life. And I know that I'm not alone in wishing that in your life. How I endured the loneliness, how I endured the asexual existence, how I endured watching the world pass me by, that existential feeling of inadequacy that permeated my soul. The world was giving me a very, very harsh signal. And the world sent me a signal that was punitive, definitive, and damaging. And the world sent me a signal that says, you're no damn good. You're no damn good because you're fat. And if you weren't so fat, you'd be okay but you're not, you're fat. And when the world, when every arena of the world is sending you that signal from the time you are a little child in kindergarten or earlier, you start to believe it yourself. And I became defeated. 
I never tried. I never dared to dream. I never dared to work hard. I was lazy. I'm not going to excuse that. I was lazy. I was scared. I feared abandonment. I feared so many things in life. I never completed tasks. I never had the perseverance to hang in there and get things done. And I didn't give a damn. I just didn't care. I cared, but I didn't. And I wish to God that I could go back and change everything that I loused up, but I will never get that chance. So the challenge of my life today as a recovered addict is to live from this point forward. But yet there are so many things from 65 years ago that impact me today. The mind and body are marvelous mechanisms. I want to talk about the body. I was emasculated by this disease. I was physically and emotionally emasculated by this disease. I was torn to shreds by this disease. But I also, I've given you the part about the mind. I could go on and on, but I won't because we have ground to cover and I, I need to cover it with you. But I want to talk about the body. And I don't just want to talk about the scars on the back of my ankles and the calves where the edema was so acute, the swelling, edema is swelling. And it occurs in the morbidly obese because it is impossible for the heart to pump the fluids and blood through the system when you're that size that I was. I have nickel, dime, and penny size ulcers, head ulcers in the back of my calves where the pus used to run out. And the sores would get infected. And I was constantly itching because of the infection. And I would bust the scabs. And I would have to go to wound care at a hospital so that they could try to help me. The cracks in my feet, the fissures in my fissures in my feet. It was like walking on broken glass because the calluses of my feet were so horrible because of the obesity that to this day, I have to apply a product that moisturizes the bottom of my feet every night before I go to sleep. The dry skin that is characteristic of the obese. To this day, I have lost over 500 pounds. I have done everything that you and God have asked me to do. And yet I still have bubby arms and I have thunder thighs. Thanks, mom. I have thunder thighs. I have vestiges of fat on my body that only a surgeon can remove. So this disease does not just make you fat. It makes you hate yourself. It makes you loathe the images of yourself in mirrors, store windows, anything that reflects back is a nightmare. Anything that reflects back with the reality of what you look like is a nightmare. I never had the ability to walk into an environment, a room, a restaurant, a banquet hall, and say, gosh, I look good. I never had the ability to walk like a person. Now I can, now I do. I walk three miles a day, six days a week. But when I was in my 20s, when you're supposed to be in the prime of your life, I could hardly walk. I could hardly stand. I could hardly sit. I couldn't fit in a seat in an airplane. I couldn't fit in a theater seat. I didn't go to the movies for decades because I couldn't fit in the seat. I couldn't get in a car. I couldn't get out of a car. I broke in furniture. I broke my friend's waterbed. 
I have been humiliated by this disease in every way that you can humiliate a person. There was no keeping secrets for the morbidly obese because everything about my disease was front page because I could not walk into a room and fool anybody into thinking that everything was okay. My disease was out there and my disease was public. From the time I was a kid, I was the fat guy that lived on Albany Street. That was my identity. Not with my friends or, you know, whatever, but that was how people knew me. I was that fat guy that lived on Albany Street. I was that fat guy at Mather. You mean the fat guy? That's a sophomore? Yeah, I know that guy. Man, is he big. I have been humiliated by this disease in every way possible that you can humiliate a person. I have been taken to the woodshed and given a beating. I have been given a beating that was not only unmerciful, unmerciful, but in some ways permanent. So let's go to the chapter, now that we've talked about the mind and the body, and let's take a look at page six. And we're in Bill's story, and we're on page six. The mind and body are marvelous mechanisms for mine endured this agony two more years. I find it amazing when I hear of the human spirit overcoming a prisoner situation, like a prisoner of war or a hostage situation, or people that have been unfairly imprisoned. It's amazing what the mind and body will endure. And Bill is writing that his mind and body endured this agony. What agony? The agony of the down spiral of his life, not just in drinking more and more and more, but in being more and more defeated by his alcoholism. Let's go on. Sometimes I stole from my wife's slender purse when the morning terror and madness were on me. He was so scared and so hallucinating that he would need liquor and if he couldn't get his hands on any money, he would steal from Lois. How low do you have to go? Here was a guy that was the darling of Wall Street. He was living on Park Avenue. He is was a New York City stock speculator of the highest repute. He was Bill Wilson. The people that came to him invested millions and thousands because of his opinion. Do you remember what we read on page three? Do you remember that we read that it said my judgment and ideas were followed by many to the tune of paper millions? That's what this disease does. It's not just about more alcohol going in your body. It's not just about more food going in your body. It is about the total demise of the mind and spirit of a human being. That the defeat to this disease, you capitulate in every way that humans can capitulate to an illness. It would be merciful if when I was five years old that this disease would have just killed me. I'm glad it didn't. I'm glad I'm alive. But it would have been more merciful in many ways. Now, I have a good life today. I have a good life today. I I, I, I mean, I, I walk and I function and I, I, I may not be, you know, whatever, but I can walk into a room and I'm not a spectacle and I can go to a movie and fit in the seat and I can, I, I have somebody to go to the movies with and I, I can go on an airplane and, and I can, I can walk and I can function. Those are not small miracles. They're amazing miracles. And I don't break furniture anymore. 
I don't break furniture anymore. I can fit in a car. I can fit in the back seat of a car. Wow. Blows my mind. Blows my mind. Sometimes to this day, I look at a pair of pants that fits me. And I think to myself, that's not going to go on one leg. And they fit fine. Because in my mind's eye, I'm still waist size 78. I'm still waist size 60 or 66 or 72. And I look at some of these clothes that I wear. I'm wearing clothes today that came from a normal store. Blows my mind. It blows my mind. So the mind and body of Bill Wilson are defeated here, but only God can resurrect him. But let's see what, what else we can learn from this paragraph. It's very important. Again, I swayed dizzily before an open window or the medicine cabinet where there was poison, cursing myself for a weakling. What do you mean he's a weakling? He should kill himself, he feels. And he's not, so he must be weak. He wants to kill himself. Wait a minute. Let's go back to page one. On the bottom of page one, if you would. Keep your finger or something in where we're reading on page six. But let's go back to page one, the last paragraph. And in the last paragraph of page one, it says, 22, and a veteran of foreign wars, I went home at last. I fancied myself a leader. Notice it doesn't say others fancied me a leader. I fancied myself. His opinion of himself is healthy. People on vision will say, oh, he's egotistical. Oh, he's, he's a blowhard. Oh, he's full of himself. No, don't we all? Isn't that healthy for all of us to think that we can be leaders? Isn't that mentally healthy? Okay. For is not the men of my battery given me a special token of appreciation? Now, normally, self-esteem isn't something that is coming from within. It is reflective. Self-esteem is more often than anything else reflective. How is it reflective? If you think I'm okay, and there's 130 of you here listening to me, so it gives me the idea that I might have something to say. So what you think of me is positive. So what I'm going to think of me is going to reflect that back and be positive too. Okay. Self-esteem is usually reflective. If you all think I'm pretty good, I must be pretty good. If you all think I'm a yutz, then I must be a yutz. Okay. Let's continue on page one. My talent for leadership, I imagine would place me at the head of vast enterprises, which I would manage with the utmost assurance. Now go with me to page three, please. We just read this. I'm going to read it again. My judgment and ideas were followed by many to the tune of paper millions. Again, he thinks himself okay. He, he gave information on the previous paragraph to his higher ups on Wall Street, and they gave him uh, uh, an option, and he made several thousand dollars for the year. Let's go to page four. On page four, it says, but by the following spring, we were living in our accustomed style. I felt like Napoleon returning from Elba, no St. Helena for me. Elba is an island that Napoleon was banished to, where he regained his empire. But Helena, when he's banished there, is kaput. He never comes. He's done. Now, let's go back to page six, where we were originally reading today. There were flights to city to country and back as my wife and I sought escape. Escape from what? Escape from his alcoholism. The, the Burnhams had a home in Manchester, Vermont. So when he's talking about the country, that's what he's talking about. 
Manchester, Vermont is right across from East Dorset, Vermont. And who do we know that's from East Dorset, Vermont? That's right, Bill Wilson. And that's how they met, guys. They met in Vermont. That's how they met. Then came the night when the physical and mental torture were so hellish, I feared I would burst through my window sash and all. Most of you don't know what a window sash is. It's the chain in my childhood where you pick up the window and the sash would kind of hold it steady. Somehow I managed to drag my mattress to a lower floor lest I suddenly leap. A doctor came with a heavy sedative. Next day found me drinking both gin and sedative. This combination soon landed me on the rocks. People feared for my sanity, so did I. I could eat little or nothing when drinking and I was 40 pounds underweight. So we see him in a situation where the disease of alcoholism has robbed him of his will to live. But his mother and Dr. Leonard Strong, Dr. Leonard Strong was married to Dorothy Wilson, who was Bill's sister. They had hope for him. Lois beseeched them to get involved. She begged them to try to help Bill. Bill was dying before her eyes. He was drunker and drunker and drunker. And the progression of the disease was apparent. He was getting worse and worse and worse. And remember that this disease has the two things, the mental twist and the physical allergy, but it also has three characteristics. And those three characteristics are, it is permanent, it is progressive, and it is, if untreated, fatal. The disease never goes away. I've been abstinent for 25 years. That's longer than a lot of you have been around in program, but I've been abstinent for 25 years. Well, my disease got worse over that time. It didn't stay the same or get better. And one of the things that can kill me is this idea that because I'm not eating, my disease isn't getting worse. And that is simply not the case. What else about this disease? It is permanent. It is progressive. It gets worse and worse and worse. Okay. Well, in the next paragraph on page seven, we are going to see the hand of God. And most people, if they're like me, when they see the hand of God, they thank him. And I thank God that Bill Wilson was saved because had Bill Wilson not been saved, I wouldn't be here now. Nor would you. You might not be dead, but you certainly wouldn't be here at this meeting. You wouldn't be here. So my brother-in-law, this is April of 1933. Bill Wilson is in deplorable condition. He hasn't got a pot to pee in or a window to throw it out of. He is drunk all the time. He's 40 pounds underweight. He's got delirium tremens. He is suicidal. He is declining right before Lois's eyes in every way that a human being can decline. My brother-in-law is a physician. This is Dr. Leonard Strong. And through his kindness and that of my mother, I was placed in a nationally known hospital for the mental and physical rehabil rehabilitation of alcoholics. And this would be the Towns Hospital in New York City. And the Towns Hospital's medical director was William Duncan Silkworth. Under the so-called belladonna treatment, my brain cleared. Belladonna is really a poison. Now, what Dr. Towns discovered, you could take this 
poison and cut it. And if you cut the poison, it would act as a sedative. And as a sedative, it became extremely effective in treating alcoholics through their delirium tremens. You see, some alcoholics die because they stop drinking. And when they stop drinking, the withdrawal from alcohol is so dangerous that they die. Anybody that thinks that in alcoholics and drug addicts, that a lot of them can get just get sober and clean on their own, uh-uh. We can in with food, yes, but a lot of alcoholics die because of the withdrawal, and so do drug addicts. So this belladonna would act as a sedative so that they would calm their delirium tremors. A lot of some of these guys, they look like an Airedale trying to crap out a peach pit. And, you know, you, you, the, the, the heart is a muscle too. And if the heart gets affected by the delirium tremens, well, it was nice knowing you. So this belladonna was very important. The belladonna treatment, my brain cleared, hydrotherapy and mild exercise helped much, helped him feel better. Best of all, I met a kind doctor, Silkworth, who explained that though certainly selfish and foolish, I had been seriously ill bodily, the allergy, and mentally, the twist. Now, Bill has just been informed in April of 1933, what is the problem? The problem is he is drunk. Now, Dr. Silkworth doesn't know yet whether Bill is a heavy drinker or he is a moderate drinker, or he is an alcoholic. He doesn't know. All he knows is what's in front of him. Here's a man that got in trouble with alcohol. He doesn't know, you know where Bill fits into the scheme of things. He's very suspicious that he's an alcoholic based on the pathology that Bill and Lois are presenting him with of the 17 years of drunkenness, 16 at this point, of drunkenness that Bill has suffered from. But he's not exactly sure that Bill's an alcoholic. We're going to find out very soon how he makes sure. Now, in the, in April of 1933, Bill will enter the hospital and leave the hospital. And he's got this knowledge now of what is wrong. The allergy of the, if he is alcoholic, the allergy of the body and the twist of the mind. Now, if he's not an alcoholic, then these things are not operative. He just needs to stop drinking, but he knows he can't do that. He's tried before. Remember, he says there were periods of sobriety which renewed my wife's hope. He knows that he can't stick to that. So he's he's been told he is seriously ill bodily and mentally. Let's see where he goes on self-knowledge. I'm on page seven, middle of the page. It relieved me somewhat to learn that in alcoholics, the will is amazingly weakened when it comes to combating liquor, though it often remains strong in other respects. There are many of you on this Zoom meeting right now that have accomplished enviable things. PhDs, master's degrees, undergrad degrees, some of you are our are, are parents and some of you have raised wonderful children and some of you have accomplished great things. But there's one thing you've never been able to accomplish. And that is you've never been able to lick this disease on your own willpower, your cunning and your intellect. You've never been able to do anything close to beating this disease. Although you have other credentials in your life that speak to a strong spirit and a very above average intellect, but you've never been able to do what it is you most wanted to do. And that is control this disease, figure this out and defeat it. You've never been able to do that. My incredible behavior in the face of a desperate desire to stop was explained. 
understanding myself now, I fared forth in high hope. So he thinks maybe self-knowledge will do this. For three or four months, the goose hung high. What does that mean, the goose hung high? It's an expression of wealth and success. And it's, a, it's an expression of, of, uh, of, of success and of um, accomplishment. Chickens are synonymous with poor people. Geese, goose, duck, only the wealthy. You remember when you watched the Christmas Carol at the end? He sends the boy to the store and he doesn't say, bring me back a chicken. He says, the goose that's in the window, is it there still? And the little boy says, yes, I believe it is, sir. He says, bring me the goose. And he brings a goose to tiny Tim and his family. Doesn't bring a chicken. He brings a goose because geese are more a symbol of power and wealth and success. The goose hung high. A lot of people don't know that expression today because you don't hear it. But the goose hung high is an expression of success. Okay. I For three or four months, the goose hung high. I went to town regularly and even made a little money. Wow, that's the first time in years he's made any money. Surely this was the answer, self-knowledge. What do we see in the next paragraph? Because of the progression of the disease. But it was not. So people may say, well, if the disease is progressive, how did he gain a little bit of sobriety during the summer of 33? Sheer willpower, but it doesn't last. Sheer willpower, but it does not last. But it was not for the frightful day came when I drank once more. The curve of my declining moral and bodily health fell off like a ski jump. After a time, I returned to the hospital. This is April of 34, one year almost to the day of his initial hospitalization, he will return to the town's hospital for the second of his three hospitalizations. In Pasadon, we learn that Bill was hospitalized four times, but in the big book, he describes three hospitalizations. After a time I returned to the hospital, this was the finish. Why is he in so much worse tr trouble this time? Because he had the knowledge that Silkworth gave him and he's flat on his keister in a hospital, very defeated. Very defeated. The curtain, it seemed to me, my weary and despairing wife was informed that it would all end with heart failure during delirium tremens or I would develop a wet brain perhaps within a year. She would soon have to give me over to the undertaker or the asylum. Now, Dr. Silkworth is looking at Bill and he is certain at this point that Bill is an alcoholic. Bill is not a heavy drinker. Bill is not a moderate drinker. Bill is not somebody who got in trouble with liquor because of some circumstance. Bill is an alcoholic and Silkworth is certain of it. And he is explaining to Lois. Now you have to remember that there is no solution for alcoholism in the world yet, yet. None that is known to anybody. Nobody knows that there is a solution because the nexus, the joining together, the confluence of the problem and the solution will not take place for a few more months. This is April of 34 and the nexus or the confluence will not occur until late November of 34. So it's seven more months until the problem and the solution will come together. Seven more months. Okay, let's continue. They did not need, I'm at the bottom of seven. They did not need to tell me. I knew and almost welcomed the idea. 
Now, Bill is 38 years old at this time. 38 years old. He has been drunk for the better part of 17 years. It is 1934. He begins drinking in 1917. He will stay mostly the drunk throughout this entire time. And the more it gets late, the, the later it gets, the more drunk he stays. The later it gets, the more suicidal he becomes. Why is that? Because of the progressive nature of this disease. Do I think the way Bill thinks? Yes. Do I eat the way Bill drinks? Yes. Do I relate to Bill Wilson? Yes. I want to live today. I have everything to live for today. I have someone I want to live with today. I have goals in my life today. I wake up in the morning and I thank God that I'm alive, but that was not the case for decades and decades of my life. I did not want to live in this world because I saw no point. I'm going to live in this world to be alone, to be some yutz, so that I can eat more uh, Malamar cookies and Chips Ahoy cookies and Doritos than any five people put together? Is that why I'm here? Did I commit some neonatal crime spree? Did I kill someone neonatally that I shouldn't have and I'm being punished? Why am I being punished? Why was God so benevolent to others that he had families and parents and brothers and sisters, cousins, aunts, uncles, and a future and wealth and youth. Why was I being singled out to be punished? Those were the things that went through my head. So now you want me to live? You want me to dream? You want me to dare to dream? And I don't know how. I don't know how. Because this disease massacred me and defeated me in every single way you can defeat another person. Physically, financially, romantically, emotionally, you name it, and I was beaten down by it. And so were many of you. Let's continue. I'm at the very last few words of page seven. I knew and almost welcomed the idea. It was a devastating blow to my pride, top of eight. I, who had thought so well of myself and my abilities and my of my capacity to surmount obstacles, was cornered at last. Now I was to plunge into the dark, joining the endless procession of sots. What is a sot? A sot is a drunk who had gone on before. I thought of my poor wife. There had been much happiness after all. What would I not give to make amends? But that was over now. He loved Lois and Lois loved him. Yeah, he was a bit of a rascal. So don't bring it up during Q&A because it's not anything I'm going to address. He was a bit of a rascal. But they loved each other very much. He just had kind of a weird way of showing it at times. But they loved each other very much. And if it wasn't for her, he knows damn well he'd have been in a gutter someplace dead. He'd have been in a gutter dead long before this period of time. She was a good little Al-Anon. And she took care of him through all of his shenanigans. I'm on eight. No words can tell of the loneliness and despair I found in that bitter morass of self-pity. Quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. I had been overwhelmed. Alcohol was my master. That bitter morass of self-pity still calls me today. It still calls me today. 
I have to do what I have to do to avoid it because it's not helping me at all. But what I have here in this paragraph is absolutely relatable to Bill. Do I think the way Bill thinks? Yes. Do I eat the way Bill drinks? Yes. Do I relate? Am I a compulsive overeater? Yes. Do I relate to Bill? Yes. I relate to every damn word and punctuation and syllable and you name it. I relate right down the line. That bitter morass of self-pity, quicksand stretched around me in all directions. I had met my match. Wow. Next paragraph. Trembling, I stepped from the hospital a broken man. Fear sobered me for a bit. Then came the insidious insanity of that first drink. And on Armistice Day, 1934, that would be a November 11th. What you would call Veterans Day today was Armistice Day, because that's the day that the armistice, the peace was signed for World War I, and it became a national holiday. He was a golfer. He loved to golf. And he went on the bus. Lois had a few dollars. And she sent him to go golfing. And the golf course was at the end of the line. And there was a man who got on the bus with a rifle. Could you imagine getting on a bus today with a rifle to go shooting? Could you imagine what would happen to you if you did that today? But he had his golf clubs and this other guy had a rifle. And the guy was with the rifle was going to go skeet shooting at a range right near the golf course at the end of the line. And Bill Wilson is a bullshitter from way back. And he strikes up a conversation with this guy. And he's telling this guy that he's golfing and he's this and he's that. Well, the bus gets into an accident. And, and a car hits the bus. And they have to de-bus to wait for another bus. So they go into a bar. And Bill Wilson is telling this guy why he's not going to drink. And he's telling the guy about all his hospitalizations and problems with alcohol. And the, the, the bartender, who for whatever reason Bill describes as a big Irish guy, how, the, how Bill knew he was Irish, I don't know. But he says the guy comes over with two beers and said, were you guys in the war? They says, yes. He says, the beers are on me. And he's telling this guy about all the horrible things that happened to him from his alcoholism. And without even thinking about it, he drinks the beer. And the guy says, are you crazy? After everything you've told me? Well, what happened to Bill Wilson after he drank a beer? He triggered the physical allergy. And he drunk within a very short period of time. I have taken candy into my mouth without even thinking about it, cookies and, and, and little egg rolls and little appetizers. I have eaten them without even thinking about, it's like a natural reflex, like the doctor hits your knee with the hammer and your leg goes up. That's how quick it can happen. That's how fast it can happen. I have eaten massive amounts of food because it started with one piece of candy, one cookie, one whatever, and then the allergy was triggered and I was off to the races. I didn't intend to eat that crap. I know I don't want to, but I'm eating against my will because there's a reflex. The mind is looking for that effect that sense of ease and comfort, and somebody passed the candy, somebody passed the cookies or the appetizers. Uh, you know, there's a line in the Godfather to part two. He says, can appease my ass. That's a Ritz cracker and chopped liver. You put a Ritz cracker and chopped liver in front of me, and I'll make, I'll make very, very quick work of the, of the Ritz crackers and the chopped liver. They'll be gone in nothing flat, nothing flat. And the guy is astounded, but the guy can go and leave the bar and Bill can't. 
and Bill has to go home and Lois finds Bill asleep between the doors of the home. You know, there's an outer door and then there's the door to get in. the. That's where she finds him asleep, where he's vomited on himself. And that's how she finds him. What a disgraceful episode once again. Let's continue. Everyone became resigned to the certainty that I would have to be shut up somewhere or would stumble along to a miserable end. How dark it is before the dawn. In reality, that was the beginning of my last debauch. I was soon to be catapulted into what I like to call the fourth dimension of existence. There's height, width, and depth. Height, width, and depth are the three dimensions. And then the fourth dimension is the dimension of the spiritual, of God. I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. You won't get better promises than that. I was to know happiness, peace, and usefulness in a way of life that is incredibly more wonderful as time passes. Near the end of that bleak November, I sat drinking in my kitchen with a certain satisfaction. I reflected there was enough gin concealed about the house to carry me through that night and the next day. My wife was at work. I wondered whether I dared hide a full bottle of gin near the head of our bed. I would need it before daylight. Now, November 11th triggered the allergy. He is drunk now all the time. Now, a couple of things. Just a reminder, March the 10th, we're going to change times. So for this Saturday morning meeting, you will not change unless you're in Arizona. If you're in Arizona, it's going to start one hour earlier. We didn't get a lot of numbers today. We only got 130. I'm still thinking we may do this a little earlier, but I won't spring that on you. You'll know a month or two in advance if we're going to change. So don't worry about it today. Now, July 12th, 13th, and 14th, we're having a retreat in Phoenix at the Crown Plaza. It's going to be great. Please come. OAPhoenix.org. OAPhoenix.org to register. Now, before I go to Q&A, I am going to excuse myself for one second before I turn it over to Sue L. I'm going to take care of something. I'll be right back. It'll take me less than a minute. I need to do something, but I'm going to turn it over to Sue L. And Sue, you're the uh, you're the act now. You got to keep them busy, uh, juggle or play the piano or something. And I'll be back in just one. Thanks, Harry. I'm just going to stop the recording. Okay, here we go.